Hop on that. Hey, hi, hello. Welcome back. Alexandrine Codex. I'm small today because I'm lazy and I didn't want to switch the scene over. It, it literally would have taken like 30 seconds, but that's what my bandwidth is at today. Uh, yeah. Gonna read you more of this and talk some more about Che because, uh, yeah, yeah. So, part three. We're 18 pages in. Buckle the fuck up. Settle in, get comfy, because this is, this is going to take a minute. Guerrilla tactics. In military language, tactics are the practical method of achieving grand strategic objectives. In one sense, they complement strategy, and in another, there are more specific rules within it. As a means, tactics are much more variable, much more flexible than the final objectives. They should be adjusted continually during the struggle. There are tactical objectives that remain constant throughout a war, and others that vary. The first thing to be considered is the adjusting of guerrilla action to the action of the enemy. So again, uh, this attitude that the guerrilla fighter, the guerrilla uh, column should be a reactive and reflexive force rather than a proactive one, at least initially. The fundamental characteristic of a guerrilla band is mobility. This permits it, in a few minutes, to move far from a specific theater, and in a few hours, even from a region, if that becomes necessary, permits it to constantly change front and avoid any type of encirclement. As the circumstances of a war require, the guerrilla band can de dedicate itself exclusively to fleeing from encirclement which is the enemy's only way of forcing the band into a decisive fight which might be unfavorable. It could also change the battle into a counter encirclement Small bands of men who are presumably surrounded by an enemy, when suddenly the enemy is surrounded by stronger contingents. Or men located in a safe place serve as a lure, leading to the encirclement and annihilation of the entire force and supply of an attacking force characteristic of this war of mobility is a so-called minuet, named from the analogy of the dance. The guerrilla bands encircle an enemy position, an advancing column, for example, they encircle it with completely from the four points of the compass, with five or six men in each place, far enough away to avoid being encircled themselves. The fight is started at any one of the points, the army will move toward it. The guerrilla band will then retreat, always maintaining visual contact, and initiates attack from another point. The army will repeat its action, and the guerrilla band will repeat the same. Thus, successively, it's possible to keep an enemy column immobilized, forcing it to expend large quantities of ammunition and weakening the morale of its troops without incurring great danger. Now, that's kind of an ideal, right? He, he's describing one specific tactic, and one would think any, any commander captain worth their salt upon noticing the trend of hmm, we're being hit from a direction and then they retreat and then we're hit from another you split your forces and respond to all those equally because presumably presumably the uh, standing army probably is uh, equipped to subdivide and uh, attack on multiple vectors but it's an interesting strategy right again this emphasis on mobility uh, a war of mobility is not is not a 20th or 21st century idea. It's become increasingly possible and popularized due to mechanization, automization of warfare. But it, it draws its roots back to primarily cavalry-driven campaigns <clears throat> with Mongols or... Um, oh my god. The Huns and other semi-migratory groups, the uh, hit-and-run, hit-and-run tactics, have a long historical precedent of being able to counter a well-armored, well-entrenched foe if you hit them where they're not get them at their weak points and then run away by the time that they try to respond. In this sort of war of attrition, 
you can wear down significant standing enemy forces. The same tactic can be applied at nighttime, closing in more and showing greater aggressiveness because in these conditions, counter-encirclement is much more difficult. Movement by night is another important characteristic of a guerrilla band, enabling it to advance into position for an attack and, where the danger of betrayal exists, to mobilize in new territory. The numerical inferiority of the guerrilla makes it necessary that attacks always be carried out by surprise. This great advantage is what permits the guerrilla fighter to inflict losses on the enemy without suffering losses. In a fight between a hundred men on one side and ten on the other, losses are not equal where there is one casualty on each side. The enemy loss is always reparable. It amounts to only one percent of their effectiveness. The loss of a guerrilla band requires more time to be repaired because it involves a soldier of high specialization and is ten percent of the operating force. It's a little counterintuitive, right? Uh, when we talk about guerrilla movements, when we talk about popular insurgencies, there's this notion that, uh, especially here in the United States, when we talk about the October Revolution, when we rarely do in uh, Soviet Russia, when we talk about, oh god damn it, uh, the various movements of the Chinese Revolution, what we imagine in the United States and what we perpetuate in the United States is that the people all rose up as one and there's this notion that when a revolution happens the majority of people the manpower the reserves would be on the side of the revolter that a populist movement would obviously have 10 or 100 peasants or commoners to throw at the elite. But that's just not the case. It has been, occasionally, historically. But even in the case of our own revolution in the United States, the vast, 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 vast majority of people were neutral. Now, of course, after a successful revolution, everybody claimed to have been a patriot in their time and characterizes their actions or inactions, their way of life as contributing to the cause. But, fairly, those same people, had the revolution been lost, would have used the same sort of creative narrative telling and creation to construe how they were loyalists the entire time. People are averse to conflict. So, even if it is a populist movement, even if the majority, even the vast majority of the population are on the side of the guerrilla band, that does not ensure or necessitate that you'll have numbers on your side. In fact, given material and economic realities, you will likely always be outnumbered. A dead soldier of a guerrilla ought never to be left with arms or ammunition. The duty of every guerrilla soldier, whenever a companion falls, is to recover immediately these extremely precious elements of the fight. In fact, the care which must be taken of ammunition and the method of using it are further characteristics of guerrilla warfare. In any fight between a regular force and a guerrilla band, it is always possible to know one from the other by their different manner of fire. A great amount of firing on the part of the regular army, sporadic and accurate shots on the part of the guerrillas. So, that informs what sort of tactics you can undertake as well. Uh, something like suppressive fire, firearms that uh, use shock value as part of their appeal and offensive force. Uh, not so useful to a guerrilla force. Uh, as, again, demonstrated during the American Revolution, what we like to think of when we talk about how we won the American Revolutionary War was our use of rifles, our use of long rifles, and eschewing the traditional roles of fighting in columns, but instead taking cover. At the time, those tactics and actions were thought of as unsporting, ungentlemanly, terrorist type of activities even. 
Once one of our heroes, now dead, had to employ his machine guns for nearly five minutes, burst after burst, in order to slow up an advance of enemy soldiers. This fact caused considerable confusion in our own forces because they assumed from the rhythm of fire that the key position must have been taken by the enemy. Since this was one of the rare occasions where departure from the rule of saving fire had been called for because the importance of the point being defended. Kind of a neat story. It could be fictionalized, of course. But still. Another fundamental characteristic of the guerrilla soldier is their flexibility. Their ability to adapt themselves to all circumstances and to convert to their service all the accidents of the action. Against the rigidity of classical methods of fighting, the guerrilla fighter invents their own tactics at every minute of the fight and constantly surprises the enemy. So again, that goes back to what I was saying about uh, unusual tactics being employed during the American Revolution, unusual tactics being employed during the French Resistance, for example, things of that effect. Uh, while it's no doubt valuable to know your enemy, as Sun Tzu would have claimed, to act like your enemy doesn't necessarily do you any good. If they're faced with familiarity, they're trained much better than you are how to respond to that familiarity. In the first place, they're only elastic positions, specific places that the enemy cannot pass, and places of diverting. Frequently, the enemy, after easily overcoming difficulties and a gradual advance, is surprised to find themselves suddenly and solidly detained without possibility of moving forward. This is due to the fact that guerrilla defended positions, when they have been selected on the basis of a careful study of the ground, are invulnerable. Not the number of attacking soldiers that counts, but the number of defending soldiers. Once that number has been placed there, it can nearly always hold off a battalion with success. It is a major task of the chiefs to choose well the moment and place for defending a position without retreat. I, you know, arguably still true, but I would make the case that static defensive warfare and tactics have been on a severe strategic decline really since like the 1930s. Uh, just consistently, that a war of mobility and uh, a defense in depth seems more feasible and effective, given just the obscene, <laughs> obscene um, tools in, available in the arsenal of a modern military force. The form of attack of a guerrilla army is also different, starting with surprise and fury, irresistible. It suddenly converts itself into total passivity. The surviving army resting will believe its attacker to have departed. They'll begin to relax, to return to routine life of camp or the fortress, when suddenly a new attack bursts forth in another place with the same characteristics, while the main body of the guerrilla band lies in wait to intercept reinforcements. At other times, an outpost defending a camp will be suddenly attacked by the guerrilla, dominated and captured. The fundamental thing is surprise and rapidity in the attack. And he's trying to demonstrate that if you do the same thing twice, make it look like you're not doing that, or use that to your advantage in predicting the response to that same attack and using that to your advantage. Uh, these are all pretty trivial uh, strategic and tactical forms of advice, right? Uh, this is this good planning, but he's he's trying to really demonstrate this this difference for folks who prior to okay prior to uh, the 1960s. The only real documentation, so far as I'm aware, in modern history of how a guerrilla or resistance group should fight was pretty limited and was written, to my understanding, with the assumption of foreign and international backing, uh, with cooperation with uh, traditional standing armies. So now it's a little old hat. 
and assumed a lot of the tactics and strategies or uh, philosophies that Che is suggesting of employing, but at the time, it was a bit more groundbreaking. Not new by any account, because resistance has been happening for a long, long time. Acts of sabotage are very important. It's necessary to distinguish clearly between sabotage, a revolutionary and effective method of warfare, and terrorism, a measure that is generally ineffective and indiscriminate in its results, since it often makes victims of innocent people and destroys a large number of lives that would be valuable to the revolution. Terrorists should be considered uh, terrorism should be considered a valuable tactic when it's used to put to death some noted leader of the oppressing forces, well known for their cruelty, their efficiency in repression, or other quality that makes their elimination useful. But the killing of persons of small importance is never advisable, since it brings on an increase in reprisals, including deaths. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Um, that seems like a really gray line to me, a really thin gray odd line between determining when it's okay to inflict collateral damage, as we colloquially call it here in the United States, and when it's not. Now, my imagining is that there's probably a formula for when it's acceptable and when it's unacceptable. There's probably a standard operating procedure that the United States Armed Forces engage in when trying to make these sorts of decisions. And it's interesting that it's always terrorism when it is the other people, but it's never terrorism when it's you. For example, um, artillery barrages, while technically and often used to break enemy positions through percussive and concussive force, it's also the impact on morale, right? The explosions, the screaming, the sound, the thunder, that is used to scare people, to terrorize people. Uh, the bombing of civilian centers during World War II, whether it be London or Dresden, Tokyo, or Manila, right? Fear is a weapon, and though historically in our narratives of war we often steer away from the truth, the truth is that the good guys employ it just as much as the bad guys, because in truth we're all bad guys when we're at war. And yeah, yeah. In the United States today, uh, there's this this notion, this attitude that the terrorism is a very clear-cut thing. That justifiable use of force and unjustifiable use of force are very clear-cut things. That in a theater of conflict, when it's justifiable to inflict civilian losses and not is a clear-cut thing and it's not. It's not a clear-cut thing. It's always terrible. It's always a bad thing. It's always a horrendous, bloody, awful thing. War is the one of the worst things we do to each other. But, if you have to do it, that's something that you have to come to up to, uh, <laughs> have to come to head with. A head with. Uh, terrorism was employed by the United States in its own revolution. And it's been applied by many armed forces, well, <laughs> precursors to armed forces in their own. Not to justify it, but it is something that in writing a book like this you have to talk about. There's one point very much in controversy in opinions about terrorism. Many consider that its use, by provoking police oppression, hinders all more or less legal or semi-clandestine contact with the masses. It makes it impossible 
unification for actions that will be necessary in a critical moment. This is correct, but it also happens that in a civil war, repression by the government power in certain towns is already so great that in fact every type of legal action is suppressed already, and any action of the masses that is not supported by arms is impossible. Therefore necessary to be circumspect, circumspect in adopting the methods of this type and to consider the consequences that they may bring for the revolution. At any rate, well-managed sabotage is always an effective arm, though it should not be employed to put means of production out of action, leaving a sector of the population paralyzed and thus without work unless this paralysis affects the normal life of society. It's ridiculous to carry out sabotage against a soft drink factory, but it's absolutely correct and advisable to carry out sabotage against a power plant. In the first case, a certain number of workers are put out of a job, but nothing is done to modify the rhythm of industrial life. In the second case, there will be again displaced workers, but this is entirely justified by the paralysis of life in the region. We'll return to the technique of sabotage later. Now this, this is an interesting point. Um, when he talks about unless it paralyzes this paralysis affects the normal life of society uh, this hadn't been written about yet but he clearly has a good grasp of the idea of social reproduction social reproduction and god I, I should remember who uh, Foucault no, God, wow. Was that Marx? Did Marx coin this term? Oh, I guess Marx did coin this term. Why, why am I remembering Foucault writing about this? Uh, O-C-O-U-T, Foucault. No, just Foucault talked about it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, of course, he has a good grasp of the idea of social reproduction. Social reproduction is the uh, ability and capability and necessity of society waking up every day and recreating itself again and doing the same things again and just perpetuating itself. It's this notion that social reproduction is something that you would have to attack, something you would have to address and meaningfully, materially, significantly change in order to change a social or economic order. Something, uh, a relevant example today, the danger of COVID-19, the danger of any epidemic, is not necessarily in the people it kills. Obviously, that's a danger, but the systemic danger, the economic danger, the political, social danger of something like this is its potential harm to social reproduction, is its potential harm in a society or culture's way to replicate and perpetuate itself day after day. Now cultures are flexible. Countries and peoples and ideologies are flexible. If you look at the United Kingdom during World War II with their food shortages and the way that they changed and adapted. And people are very adaptable creatures. We're very capable of changing our day-to-day -day way of life. But it calls things into question. After the Spanish flu epidemic in the early 20th century, the United States shortly thereafter, and by shortly thereafter, I mean immediately thereafter, had one of the largest general strikes in United States history. Events that shake things up enough to at least rattle the cage of social reproduction, at least remind us of how rickety and shaky of a foundation it is that we stand on live on, build our lives upon, often it's enough to have people go, we should shore up this foundation. We should institute reforms to help stop something from being this bad again. Now, unfortunately, often in the United States, what we do is we reinforce the top rather than the bottom, which um, you don't need an engineering background to understand why that's a terrible idea. One of the favorite arms of the enemy army, supposed to be decisive in modern times, is aviation. Nevertheless, this has no use whatsoever during a period that guerrilla warfare is in its first stages, with small concentrations of men in rugged places. 
the utility of aviation lies in the systemic destruction of visible and organized defenses. And for this, there must be large concentrations of men who construct these defenses, something that does not exist in this type of warfare. Planes are also potent against marches by columns through level places or places without cover. However, this latter danger is easily avoided by carrying out marches at night. Now, this is a, uh, this has changed a little bit. A night bombing now is just as effective as effective as day bombing, if not more, uh, because of the protection it affords the aircraft. We do have small unmanned aerial vehicles now that are fairly effective in attacking and taking out small entrenchments without putting any risk to the pilots. We have, uh, in the United States, aviation is, uh, our Air Force and our Navy are two big, big things. If we don't do anything else right, it's those two. And of course we do fucking everything. So I take this with a grain of salt. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Helicopters at this time were not the helicopters that we have today. And certainly Cuba uh, did not have the quality or quantity of a standing army as the United States then, did then or does now. So, um, I, I think Chase is probably wrong about this, and it is something you'd have to take into consideration. Uh, so far as drones go, uh, there have been a lot of interesting, interesting uh, inventions and developments with uh, anti-drone weaponry and tools. Now, the vast majority of these toolkits are aimed at taking care of civilian drones, uh, drones utilized by police surveillance, things like that. But, yeah, that's that's definitely something that would need to be taken into consideration by a modern guerrilla force, right? Uh, it does necessitate keeping smaller bands, not building fortifications, but, yeah, it, it starts to show its age here a little bit. One of the weakest points of the enemy is transportation by road and railroad. Virtually impossible to transport a vigil yard by yard over a transport line, a row or a railroad. At any point, a considerable amount of explosive charge can be planted that would make the road impassable. Or by exploding at the moment that a vehicle passes, a considerable loss in lives and materiel to the enemy is caused at the same time the road is cut. Very true. Very true today. Uh, the United States infrastructure, for example, is horrible. Used to be really good. Used to be world standard type stuff. Uh, it isn't so much anymore. Uh, it really would not take a lot to to really throttle the movement of goods in the United States. If you've ever, and you probably had have, if you've been on a cross country road trip at some point and you've gone through the West, you've probably driven past trains at the time that they're moving army equipment around, U.S. military equipment around. That sort of thing happens fairly regularly. We have a very, very big country. Chase talking about this in the context of Cuba, which is Florida, right? It's, it's sizable, but it's not huge. If it's impossible in that area to cover every square foot of track or road, it certainly is in the United States. Our infrastructure is a major, major uh, vulnerability in this country. And especially so because we defunded repairing and upkeeping and maintaining it or replacing it. So it's already a liability on its own, let alone were it sabotage. The sources of explosives are varied. They can be brought from other zones, can be made of bombs seized from the dictatorship, Though these do not always work, or they can be manufactured in secret laboratories within the guerrilla zone, the technique of setting them off is varied. Their manufacture also depends on conditions of the guerrilla band. In our laboratory, we made powder, which we use as a cap. We invented various devices for exploding the mines at the desired moment. The ones that gave the best results were electric. The first mine we exploded was a bomb dropped by an aircraft of the dictatorship. We adapted it by inserting various caps and adding a gun with the trigger pulled at a cord. 
At the moment that an enemy truck passed, the weapon was fired to set off the explosion. Obviously, there is a great deal of literature out there, uh, some of it less legal than others, detailing the construction of explosives and other controlled substances. That's not something I'm going to touch on. These techniques can be developed to a high degree. We have information in Algeria, for example, Tela explosive mines, that is, mines exploded by radio at great distances from the point which they're located, are being used today against French colonial power. And obviously this developed, right? It, Hollywood loves to portray this sort of thing. Bombs that go off with cell phones, bombs that go off with this or that, this or that. Uh, it's not, presumably, it's not as easy as uh, Hollywood makes it out to be, but... <laughs> For whatever reason, we really have a fixation in this country with just how easy it is to manufacture this sort of thing. And there are historical precedents within the last 30 years of uh, individuals <laughs> solitarily undertaking the development and utilization of these sorts of things to misguided causes and effects. It's, it's really, it's really one place where this shows its rust a little bit, and I, I harp on about this, is when he talks about specific technologies, specific mechanisms, that it's like, wow, yeah, this was a while ago, wasn't it? The technique of lying in ambush along roads in order to explode mines and annihilate survivors is one of the most, rem God damn it, remunerative in points of ammunition and arms. The surprised enemy does not use their ammunition and has no time to flee, so with the small expenditure of ammunition, large results are achieved. Again, this, this should be running in the back of your mind anytime he's talking about any of these tactics. One of the top priorities. You want to maintain... I don't know why I threw my overlay up. I hit the space bar by accident a while ago. You want to maintain your army, your standing force, right? So any sort of action that limits risk on that and any opportunity to get more ammo. So these sort of uh, ambushes, like he's detailing, are perfect for that sort of thing. As blows are dealt to the enemy, they'll also change their tactics, and in place of isolated trucks, veritable motor columns move. However, by choosing the ground well, the same result can be produced by breaking the column and concentrating forces on one vehicle. In these cases, the essential elements of guerrilla tactics must always be kept in mind. These are perfect knowledge of the ground, surveillance and foresight as to lines of escape, vigilance over secondary roads that can be used to support the point of attack, intimacy with people in the zone so as to have help from them in respect to supplies, transport, and temporary or permanent hiding places if it becomes necessary to leave wounded companions behind, numerical superiority at a chosen point of action, total mobility, and the possibility of counting on reserves. If all of these tactical requisites are fulfilled, surprise attack along the lines of communication of the enemy yields notable dividends. A fundamental part of guerrilla uh, tactics, actions, tactics, there we go, is the treatment accorded to people of the zone. Even the treatment accorded to the enemy is important. The norm should be followed with absolute inflexibility at the time of attack and absolute inflexibility toward all of the despicable elements that resort to informing and assassination and clemency as absolute as possible toward enemy soldiers who go into fight performing or believing that they perform a military duty. It's a good policy so long as there are no considerable bases of operations and vulnerable places to take no prisoners. Survivors ought to be set free. Wounded should be cared for with all possible resources at time of action. Conduct towards civil population ought to be regulated by as large a respect for the rules and traditions of people in the zone. In order to demonstrate effectively with deeds the moral superiority of the guerrilla fighter over the pressing soldier. Except in special circumstances, there ought to be no execution of justice without giving the criminal an opportunity to clear themselves. Now personally, I'm really happy that he ends that section on that note. 
if you're going to talk at all about terrorism, if you're going to talk at all about the acceptability or unacceptability of civilian casualties, it is imperative that you give voice to how the civilian population and how your enemy should be interacted with. Jay here, to his character, and to his credit, advocates for treating them well, and it isn't just in some vague, idealistic, do-good-by-others kind of mentality, which would be, in my mind, admirable in its own. No, it's for a reason. It's for a mechanism. A guerrilla fighter, a guerrilla band, is not just an individual. They are the representation of the revolution. And as he's been saying over and over and over, they are to be the chivalrous knight figure. You are to embody all the virtues of the revolution and none of the vices or flaws or demonizations cast about, or aspersions, cast about toward the revolution. So, it's PR. It's uh, propaganda, in a way. And it's very smart. It's very smart. Yeah. Yeah, I've been enjoying reading this. It's showing its age in a little bit. We're on page 25 of 140-ish. I mean, there's two books in here, so we don't have to go through the whole thing. We don't even have to keep this series going forever, but man, it's comforting to talk about when when so much talk is going around Bark Bark uh, about instability, economic collapse, pandemic. Uh, when more and more people are feeling like they have no voice they have no agency they have no possibility of agency or representation within the government and political system that we have today particularly within the economic system that we have today it is comforting to think about and read about times when people were under bad circumstances, worse circumstances, and undertook action which changed those circumstances. Again, I, I really want to emphasize this point. I don't want a revolution to be necessary in this country or in any other country. Not today, not ever. I want the very most optimistic of us to be right. I want reform, compromise, dialogue, and genuine engagement between human beings to overcome the differences between us. I want the wealthiest nation in the world's history to take care of its people and prioritize the health, welfare, fulfillment of its population above and beyond that of its corporations. what I want. I don't really believe it'll happen, though. I'm very pessimistic. I'm very pessimistic right now. So, I'm gonna wrap up for today. I'm gonna go play some Animal Crossing, because uh, you gotta disassociate somehow, otherwise I'm just sitting in quarantine thinking about how wonderful everything is. I'm fine. I really am. I'm fine. Uh, talk to me in a month, and... Might be different, but I'm fine now. And in two months, I'll probably be fine. Three months, I might be losing my mind a little bit. But we go to each other. So, uh, the, the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, recently, today, I think, started doing something uh, amazing. An emergency fund for members of the DSA, as funded by members of the DSA. Uh, 
I encourage you not to take advantage of it if you're not in absolute desperate need. And if you're a member and you are in desperate need, well, it's it's only a few hundred bucks, but it's something. To that point, though, it's exciting and encouraging to see all these organizations, like the Bernie Sanders campaign, raising significant amounts of money to care for people impacted by this pandemic. In the United States, we, we have this attitude, this prevailing attitude that the nonprofit industry, that charitable giving is more effective than federalized institutions. To this, I fundamentally disagree. And yes, I have a, st <laughs> I have a background in nonprofit funding and management. Thank you. Uh, I know how effective it can be. And that's only because of the amount of money in it and the amount of profitability in it and the incentives incentives built into that by the economic system that we have. If all these fucking millionaires and billionaires like Z fucking Zuckerberg donating like 25 million or a million and being like, oh, look at how good I am as a person. What if we put a cap on just like, I don't know, one billion. That's it, just one billion. That's the most anyone can have, and that's already an obscene number. And the surplus just automatically gets funneled into social programs. Do you have any idea how fucking well off this country would be? We'd have the healthiest, longest lived, most productive, happiest society on the planet. If we took the capital and resources that exists within this country and utilized it for popular good. But instead, any time one of the kleptocrats in power decide to throw away 0.01% of their fucking bottom line, we applaud them like they're the second coming. Okay, okay, okay. Got too political. But, but it's all shit. And it's all terrible. And everything's awful forever. But, but seriously, take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Look for opportunities to help people who are more than more in need than you are and for the love of god stay inside till later toodaloo take care see you then bye bye oh, oh okay hotkey not working now cool 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 cool